a green light's coming on. Yes, it is. Green light. Now we're ready to go. All right. Like blue light special down at our favorite Kmart or whatever it is. We're in our chapter on organizational communication, which in a sense sort of breaks nicely into two broad areas of, of analysis. One is under that heading of systems theory, structuralism, functionalism, that works on the assumption that organizations are complex sets of networks, macro networks, micro networks, and that the healthiness of the organization is the ease with, it, with which information flows within the organization, making its way along, getting to individuals that need it. We talked about information overload, certain people getting more information than they can handle or need or want, information underload, getting less than they would like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a well established body of literature independent in one sense, although I think substantially refined, by the second body of literature which we're going to spend our time with for most of the hour today, we will also then turn our attention to contexts as we have before we want to look at interpersonal communication context, including interviews, getting into an organization, maybe a little bit about negotiation and conflict resolution, groups, for the first time we talk seriously about groups, and we have some key elements to talk about there. Communication within the organization as a generalization and then communication from the organization externally. We now begin to add all of these points of analysis to our discussion. So here we are, if we can get our theory four uh, up on, there it is, on the projector. We talk about organizational climate and organizational culture and the sort of theme that overrides this body of literature is interpretivism. It is not unfamiliar to us, even though we're unfamiliar with this particular word, what we really are talking about, how do we interpret the culture and climate of an organization? And one of the arguments is that we do that by understanding the meaning that exists within the organization that influences how people go about doing what they do within that organization. That meaning shapes perceptions which shapes actions. Those of you that remember our discussion of ling linguistic relativity will find what we're going to talk about in terms of culture to be very familiar, very friendly. You come into an organization and you don't necessarily know what the organization is about, how we go about doing what we do. Part of your initial contact with that organization, and we're going to talk about that even more later on in the context of interpersonal communication, part of that initial contact is to simply ask the question, how do we do what we do in this organization? How do we do what we do in this organization? Culture is, in that regard, tied up with meaning. Meaning refers to interpretations and perception of work and organization. Perceptions of work and organization. Work simply means what do we do? In the movie that I have clips of, which I think you're able now to access, particularly if you have real one player on your computer, and I'm telling you more than I know when I walk through software and all of this kind of thing, you could, for instance, see the clips from Office Space. I just had the good fortune of seeing it again on television the other night. And it's a very interesting and rich presentation of how culture becomes so stifling that members of the organization now are quite willing to commit larceny against the organization. Stifling to the extent that stuff is going on and people's lives are being manipulated and I sense a certain degree of alienation for those of you still looking for the connection of alienation and communication going on. Perception of work, what do we do? What's the value of the work? What use is the work? What satisfaction and enjoyment do I get out of my work? 
And finally, the nature of the organization as an organization. What is the University of Houston? I was in the library one night, and it wouldn't make any difference whether I was there night or day. That's simply a context. And a student, I guess, walked in, looked enormously confused. I was standing at the information desk, and she walked over and she said to the people at the information desk, where are the books? I am going back one of these days to find the woman that answered her question because I know her, I've known her for years, and I wanted to know what she thought of a student that walks in and says, where are the books? Has she been on a university campus before? Has she even been to a big library like that one downtown called the Houston City Library? Or is it one of those sort of high school libraries where you walk in and there are a bunch of books? Heaven forbid that she would have been where I was when I did my doctoral work, the University of Illinois, which at that time was the third largest library in the, in the United States. I think we had 27 libraries scattered around campus. Big Ten universities often have that. So finding the books is sometimes finding the libraries. And they're all over the place. Undergraduate libraries, business libraries, law libraries, social science libraries, humanities libraries, and whatever they might be. And even within libraries, you may have libraries. Well, how do you know all of that? Where do you go? What do you learn? A number of years ago, I was off to do rare book work, and I showed up, and they gave me a nice little pair of white gloves. I couldn't touch anything with my bare hand. I had to use little white cotton gloves. They stripped me of anything that was a permanent writing item. They gave me their own particular pencils, which were designed to be very erasable if I just happened to mark on one of their precious little books, etc., 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 right? Rare books, archives, all of that sort of thing. Well, what are we doing? What's going on? How does all of this work? And now, of course, in your generation, all of this is on electronic, and that leaves people like me a loss because I'm a rummager. I've learned a long time ago, but you rummage, you rummage online. I don't like that because I feel like I have less control over the rummaging. Well, you see what I'm getting at is what is an organization? What is the work within that organization? It has something to do with meaning, meaning we can talk about, meaning we can even create symbols and so forth. Of. How work an organization is interpreted and enacted and enacted, meaning that some of you have actually had an opportunity to work for fast food outlets. You are told what you're supposed to say. I'm always amazed when I walk up and they say, do you want to biggie size that? Do I look like somebody that should be buying something biggie sized? Sometimes I even tell them I'm already biggie sized. But they're supposed to do that. My guess is if they don't say, do you want a biggie size that? They could lose their job. They're also dressed in uniforms, etc., etc. And in the office space, Jennifer Aniston, is that her name? I never remember these children out there, right? She's supposed to have so much flair and only had 15 items. I didn't include that, but we could have had an entire section on the culture of the fast food industry because she demonstrates that in that movie. What are we doing? How are we doing it? And as one guy says, everybody sells hamburgers, we're selling flair. Well, that may be, right? What is our organization? How it's interpreted and enacted shakes, shapes organizational effectiveness, policy, procedure, job satisfaction, and performance. Well, let's go down and see what that amounts to. One of the ways to look at climate is that climate has to do with the quality of relationships. If you remember, and there's no accounting for students' memories after an exam, us talking about the work of Rogers and Millar, control, trust, and intimacy, to what extent do those variables account for how you perform in an organization? Do some people in the organization have more control than you do? We typically work on the assumption that the higher you are in the organization, the more control you have, or at least the more control you seem to have, or the more you can convince people that you really do have control, even if you don't. Trust, to what extent do you trust your boss, do you trust your coworkers? 
And intimacy can be to what extent do you like the people that you work with. At the end of the movie, Office Spaces, our three characters have come to trust and distrust each other because now they're caught in something and people have found out what's going on. Our friend Milton probably burns the building down, gets all of the money that was slid under the door, and ends up on an island still being grumpy old Milton. But at the very, very, very end, there is the hero given up on the new tech industry and he's out now shoveling because he finds greater satisfaction in doing what his next door neighbor did, which is shoveling, building, constructing, something like that. Quality of relationships, control. Do I like the people around me? Do I trust the people around me? Do I think on a given day I'm going to be sabotaged, undercut by these people? Do I want to tell them what is a part of my life and the meaning of my life? Culture. Shared meanings that direct the play, that direct the play. You walk onto a college campus and somebody says, oh, it's homecoming weekend. Now at the University of Houston, people may say, what's homecoming? But if you were at a Big Ten University, you wouldn't say that. Homecoming becomes very, very, very important. Your parents show up and all of this kind of stuff, da 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 right? How do we do what we do? Over the weekend, I also had the opportunity to see Animal House, which is all about the business of fraternity life and all of that, the orderly conduct or the disorderly conduct of what goes on on a college campus. Well, anyone, anyway, how do we know how to do this? What are the meanings that direct the play? We'll get into more detail on that. Earlier on, we talked about the balance of socio-emotional What's the climate? And task, what do we do? We suggested, for instance, that there ought to be some balance in that regard. Otherwise, we go too far on task. We're into scientific management. We go too far in socio-emotional, and we become interested in the notion of it's got to be a country club. Universities over the last number of years have drifted a bit toward the country club. Students are supposed to be treated as customers. It's like Foley's. Student shows up and says, I didn't like the grade I got. I want to exchange it for a better grade. That's the customer model. When I was your age, I would never have thought of going into somebody and saying, you know, I just can't accept this grade. I'm sure that you've done all of this wrong. There's something fundamentally wrong with you. I know more than you do because I'm a live human being and somebody from the third to the ninth grade built a great deal of self-esteem in me. So I'm here to tell you all of the things that are wrong with you. When I was a doctoral student, true story, I walked in front of the door of the woman who eventually directed my dissertation for a month before I would go in because I knew that she would ask me questions and find out how fundamentally stupid I was. I would never have thought of saying, now Marie, you know you're just not doing your job properly. Well, you see what happens is that culture changes these sorts of things. Culture reorients our assumptions, our beliefs, etc., etc. And we can go too far in an organization worrying too much about whether people are having a good time and we don't get any work done. But the same token, we can put too much emphasis on work and not give people an opportunity. On a college campus, we have academic work and we have student life. And some of you say, but it's all work and no life to me. Well, that may be. We don't know. Structuration is an interesting concept that grows out of this because it argues that what actually happens in the organization is based not upon systems, but systems shape themselves to culture. So that what we do is the organization. Even if the organization chart says something about power, the real issue is who has the power to do what at a given day. And it may not be that the people at key places within the organization actually have power because it's been taken away from them by people that don't trust them. I could tell you more about bosses than some of you would ever want to know. Part of it is the luxury of being on a university campus, but part of it also is my sort of 
mix between progressive egalitarianism and having been an only child with an older sister. I learned to survive in an organization where power was unevenly distributed. So part of what I've learned to do is to try to redistribute the power so that I have more control over it. Well, the notion of structure. Structure may count for less in a formal way than it does based upon what it is that we do each day to create the structure of the organization. And back to the notion of culture as shared knowledge. Well, let's talk a bit more about that. Culture, patterns of shared assumptions. Patterns of shared assumptions. If we are at a small teacher's college or at a community college, are the assumptions about education and the assumptions about excellence the same as they would be at other universities? I would say probably not. Relevant to that as well, talking about universities, I had a friend that taught, and maybe he still does, in one of those very elite Virginia schools where people are now in their eighth generation and he said on a given day you look out into the class and assume that only two or three scholarship students are not somebody whose name was on the Declaration of Independence or on a village or a city or a town in Virginia. Meaning that these are the kids who are the kids of the kids of the kids who created the state. Well, it's interesting to imagine how different that is from what is the University of Houston, which even as we speak today, tends to be obviously a, quote, blue-collar kind of university. We don't have many blue-collar workers anymore, but you are a workaday, you sandwich the university life into all the other things that you do to try to survive. It isn't the way it happens at Rice. It doesn't necessarily happen that way at the University of Texas. And at A&M, you've got to build your rodeo classes into your, well, I'm just teasing. Get your snooze can that's chewing tobacco and make sure that your pickup is cleaned, meaning that there are these patterns of shared assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what do we then talk about when we talk about these shared narratives? Part of it is characters. We can do organizational analysis. I have no idea, I hope I don't, if it is I hope it's a nice nickname, but I have no idea whether the students have nicknames for me, because usually if you do, it's a bad nickname. Well, we had a faculty member that taught here for years whose name was Harwood, H-A-R-W-O-O-D, and the students called him Hardwood. Quintessential moment, student comes up, says I've got the opportunity to go off and it seems to me that she was invited to give a concert somewhere and she would miss an examination in his class. What most of us would assume to be a perfectly legitimate university activity of some great distinction. And his response to her was, I'm really sorry that you're missing my exam. She said, why? Because you cannot make it up. Why was he called Hardwood? because he was just what that word said. Now, let's imagine, I'm a consultant, I go into the organization. Do all of you remember Star Wars? No, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, let's see. I ask everybody in the organization, in one unit, in one department, in one whatever, to use a character in a movie that best describes their boss. Universally, Universally, everybody in that department referred to their boss as Darth Vader. Now, if you don't know anything about Star Wars, you don't know what I'm talking about. Darth Vader was an evil, manipulative, criminal type of individual. I think none of us would have wanted to work for Darth Vader. But we all did if we were in that department. So what do we think of our boss? What do we call our boss? One of my key elements of popular culture is the comic strip Sally Forth. Sally has worked for Ralph forever and Ralph is a quintessential male chauvinist pig and Sally is now out looking for additional work, a different job. Oh my gosh. Well characters you see. Who are we? What are the characters? 
We use words that are sometimes complementary. We use words that are sometimes not complementary, but we know what the drama is, right? What are the plots? Every story has a plot. What's the plot of the University of Houston? Once upon a time, we were nothing. We were created largely because of the influence of the Cullen family. We were created in conjunction with Houston uh, HISD. There in comes our um, being called Cougar High. Some of you have never heard of Cougar High. We're slowly getting beyond the generation of being Cougar High, perhaps. In 1963, we became state-supported. One of the problems with our plot here is that almost everywhere in the United States, when there is a university named after a town, it is because the university is a church-affiliated university. University of Albuquerque, for instance, used to be St. Joseph's of the Rio Grande. Where would you rather study? University of Albuquerque or St. Joseph's of the Rio Grande? I, I vote for St. Joseph's, but they decided to change the name to University of Albuquerque, University of Denver, University of Detroit, and so forth down the line. Church affiliated. We go out to recruit. People want to know what denomination we are representing. Ever heard of BYU? Brigham Young University. There are others around the country. Well, part of that is our plot. Where are we in terms of universities? What's the nature of our university? What's the nature of our majors? What's the nature of our curriculum? What's the nature of our her heritage, our history? Where are we going? How many Heisman Trophy winners have we turned out? How many Heisman Trophy winners did we ever turn out that went on and did nothing in professional football worth noting? How many great actors have we turned out? How many great musicians have we turned out? How many rocket scientists have we turned out? See, that's part of our plot, isn't it? Dan Rather wandered his way through here once, and we've claimed him forever. I think he flunked out of law school, but we don't care. Dan Rather became famous, therefore we want to be famous, therefore we claim Dan Rather. He actually never graduated from here. I really do believe that he took a few law courses and it didn't settle well with him and he decided to go out and get down on his hands and knees in the middle of a hurricane and the rest is history, so to speak. Scripts, what do we say? Are the scripts that you have at your local little fast food? May I take your order, please? There'll be a number one with pickles, mustard, and onions. Do you want a biggie size it? Scripts, very carefully scripted. To what extent are we scripted? Universities get to be very scripted, don't we? Certain departments get to be very scripted. Certain departments get the reputation of, for some of the scripts. Let me put you on hold. Some of you know that the minute you're put on hold, that's the end of it, right? I'll get right back to you. Never hear from them again. See, scripts. What do these scripts mean? Out of the combination of plots and scripts, what are the themes? Where are we going? Are we going to be a tier one university one of these days? Get just so many Nobel laureates and all of the wonderful stuff that everybody will say, well, there's Harvard, Yale, and the University of Houston. At one point, some president of ours referred to us as Harvard on the Bayou. I don't think we're there yet, but we might be. The scene, where does this happen? And one of the things about organizations is that we often craft our scene. Now, I've been here since 1971. I've seen the evolution of this campus a great deal. We used to have a row of relatively bad joints along Cullen coming onto campus, but you could go over there and on an afternoon have a, an adult beverage. It was kind of interesting. One time, one of our group leaning back and the chair went through the floor. Uh, I can't say that these were top-line organizations, but they were there, et cetera, et cetera. The university said, well, we shouldn't have joints like that between us and the freeway, so we put up an obelisk, which is supposed to be, what, goalposts or something? I'm not sure. All of the students pass in and out of that, but out of this, we came to have a campus. I will argue, and I haven't seen nearly enough to build this argument with certainty, but I will argue that the University of Houston campus facility environment is in the top five anywhere in the United States for an urban university. I think this is a very attractive campus. I like what's happened. I like the little flags and the little trees that are being planted out there. And some of you say, 
Well, look at rice. Their trees are old. Yes. And someday our trees will be old and you can bring your grandchildren back and you can walk along and you can point to the trees that you might have even carved your little... No students don't do that anymore, particularly not at the University of Houston. You're not a romantic era. If you would, you wouldn't carve your name in a tree. You would do something digitally on the Internet. I don't know what you would do, right? But the notion of where is our scene. I've been on various corporate settings. One of the things I find interesting is to take a guest to some of these places. You get to the top of the building or nearly the top of the building downtown and you look out and you realize that you're literally in the clouds. I've been in the clouds by being at the top of the Shell Building downtown. I've been on Exxon's campus, as they say, in Las Colinas. It's better than our campus. Pretty nifty, but still, I guess, Greenpeace could get in. Some of it is the physical scene. Some of it is the symbolic scene. The plot is what happens to the characters over time. The scene is the physical presence of the actors. For instance, if you see a movie, and I just saw Runaway Jury the other day, the scene is courtrooms in New Orleans, right? That's where it happens. Where does the University of Houston happen? Part of it also is the scene is in the city of Houston as opposed to being out in the countryside. Once upon a time, we put all the major universities out in the country. Do you know why? So that we could keep you students away from the sins of the city. You found sins anyway, probably. But there was a grand effort to keep you away from the sins that would distract you from education. But all the great Midwestern Big Ten universities were out somewhere, nowhere. And some of them are still there. I spent three long winters in the cornfields of Champaign-Urbana. Acts, acts are sort of like what we talked about, acts and coordinated management, meaning the individual events that happen each day. As I come to class each day, I am acting. You come to class, you're acting. You take a test, you're acting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And by that act and react and interact, we begin to define the enactment of our drama. Well, we'll see a theory that makes that even more explicit. Social reality culture. Culture is definitions of power. We can talk about that enactment theory, what I'm just talking about there. It is an extension of interpretivism. There's a fellow by the name of Carl Weick, W-E-I-C-K, that is a big shot, super big shot, that over the years said, developed the notion of enactment theory. It was very influential on me in my book in 1994, uh, where I talked about the conjunction of narrative theory and enactment theory, that narratives are where and how we enact. One of the things that's interesting when we talk about enactment theory as external communication, what happens if we have a product that nobody wants, or not much of it? Is it possible that once upon a time there was so much oil that you could almost not give it away? And then a guy by the name of Henry Ford invented automobiles that everybody could have, and all of a sudden we've got a market for oil. But we had to convince people that they ought to ride on planes, they ought to ride on trains, that they ought to do all kinds of things. One of the issues of marketing, advertising, and public relations is to try to convince people to adopt a new narrative of their life. I find it interesting in that regard. We talk about a nation built on the sweat of our brows. Perspiration is good, and yet... How much of all of the time on television is brought to you by deodorant ads? Perspiration is not good. We should not sweat. We should be dry. And yet we're a nation built on the sweat of our brows. Well, we get to be a crazy nation sometimes. Enactment views work as an episode presentation of an undirected play. Simply knowing that if I'm in this role, this is how I behave. We talked about that when we talked about... Uh, the business of terministic screens and dramatism before, that I learned the role of 
of teacher. Sometimes we do it in a formal way. One of, the, one of what we're trying to teach you on this campus is to be something. And I don't mean in a general sense like a good educated human being, but to develop professional skills and to develop professional attitudes and perspectives. Becoming meaningful through what is said and done. You only knew me by what I do and say. You only know my course by what we do and say. So communication is the, if you want, it is the exchange rate that we use to make all of this work in some sort of coordinated way. And this game, if you want to call it a game, and I'm happy to do that, is no different than the game at Shell or Exxon or at Microsoft or at a small church or at a big church or wherever it is, except the, the narrative is different. The narrative is different. And so when we're in each of those scenes, each of which is symbolically shaped, meaning and so forth, and we can talk a lot about that, can't we, in terms of how a university is supposed to look like a university, a church is supposed to look like a church, a business is supposed to look like a business, that's part of culture, isn't it? Organizations shape their internal environment by how they communicate, what they say, the ideas, the thoughts, the symbols, the metaphors that become a rich part of that environment. They also can shape the external environment. I think it's interesting to see the parallels between the automobile industry and the computer industry. If you go back in history, the automobile industry was an industry where people were making products that tended to fail more than they worked. Does that sound like our first adventures with computers, that they failed more than they worked? And they sell them knowingly to us, don't they? And what's interesting is that each generation, they say, this is a new and improved product. And we say, why don't you get it right and then call us in as customers? To say nothing of how many of the computers your folks bought at first that didn't make it, and eventually we came down to two platforms, is that right, essentially? PC, Mac, but some of you bought Commodores and other things that are no longer out there, I guess, or they're in the Hall of Fame. Bracketing are actions that define social reality. Bracketing are actions that define social reality, so our friend Wyke says. I show up and the people at Wendy's bracket my reality, don't they? What happens if I show up at Wendy's? Now, most of you are not old enough to remember when we, when we drove our car into filling stations and uniformed people came out of a filling station. You know what a filling station is where you buy gasoline? Now you think a filling station is where you buy beer and bread and maybe get some gasoline. It was the other way around before. You also got all the gossip in town when you went to the filling station, unless you went to the hairdresser. Either of those was just the right place to get all of the gossip in town. But if I drive into Wendy's and Wendy's say, you want us to check the air? Do you want it, us to rotate your tires? Would you like us to check your radiator? Wrong script, meaning that they will bracket my reality. And have you ever gone in and tried to work with some of these people? Even telemarketers on script can't listen to you. I play a game with them. I try to throw them off script because I know they're on script. I ask them questions about themselves. Well, how are you? They called me. I didn't call them. Where'd you go to school? What'd you have for lunch? You don't want to talk about this? I thought this was a telephone. My telephone, my service. You've called me? I tried to re-bracket this, right? Somebody called me one time and said, you have a free funeral plot. I said, fine, send me my certificate. They said, we have to deliver it. Am I stupid? I know what they're going to do. They're going to give me one and then ask me what I'm going to do about my wife. I'm going to say that's her problem. <laughs> I've got mine. Maybe we put it side by side. I don't know. I've got mine. Fine. Just send me the certificate. The guy says it doesn't work that way. And I said, why not? 
I've got to show up, and I've got to talk to you, and I've got to point to your little wife over there. It's her problem, not mine. Maybe she'll get lucky. Maybe she'll win one. Well, you see, what happened was I bracketed this arrangement, didn't I? I did not buy into the version that they wanted me to accept. And I will do my best eternally if the people calling me... See, I'm, I'm almost the kind of person that I don't want to spend $2.50. My daughter used to run again on the other phone. Oh, Dad, wait a minute. So that she could hear me deal with these telecommunication people. Now, I know that some of you do telecommunication work. And I know that you call me and you hate me because all you're trying to do is to make a living and you feed your children and so forth, right? But you call me, I will help to rebracket this conversation. How are you? Good to see you again. Didn't you just call me? Somebody else just called me. I wonder who it was that just called me. Were they working for you folks that just called me or working for somebody else? All along the line, you're saying, look, my clock is ticking, my supervisor is, and I'm saying, but you called me. Here I am, just a willing victim, just willing to be taken advantage of. Let's just visit for a while and see where this goes, right? We create, we learn, and we enact, and we do so by cultural filters, culture filters. A globalized society, we've now got to get more and more people able to work in cultures for which they did not develop a sensitivity and an understanding as they go abroad or as people from other countries come here. So it's a big challenge in global business, global humanity, global nonprofits, global government and all of this kind of stuff. Okay, enough on culture and climate. Now moving into context, interpersonal communication as a context. There's a wonderful theory that is called assimilation theory, and it talks about the strategies and challenges that we use when we enter an organization. And there are three stages to it. Stage one, I can imagine that many of you are in this stage today. Anticipatory socialization. That simply means that you are fixing to get ready to go to work. Not in terms of I got to be at work at two o'clock, but in the back of your mind, you have some job, some profession that you would like to have. We know that in the School of Communication, people want to be anchors. Your chances of doing that are about the same as being an NBA star. We know that, and, and what's interesting is that anchors stay around longer than NBA stars do. So Daniel Shore has been here a long time and is going to be here for a long time more probably, right? Some of you want to be sports people. Could be, right? What sense of the world do you have? What do you want to do? Today a student came up to me all willy-nilly and said, I think I'm going to get a job offer. And I hit her with reality. I said, what are you worth? What are you going to ask for? What's the salary? I don't know. That's part of it, young lady. They're supposed to pay you for this. How would you settle for $10,000 a year? Oh, that wouldn't be nearly enough. I have more expenses than that. You can't go into your boss and say, this is my lifestyle, therefore that's how much I need. <laughs> that's not the way it works. It works the other way around. What can they be willing to pay you? And then you adapt your lifestyle to that, right? And what are you going to do? How are you going to go about making this wonderful salary that you imagine, right? Anticipatory socialization. At what point in your life did you begin to think about work? Chances are, early enough that you can't remember thinking about that. As a child, you probably played going to school. You probably imagined your father, your mother, and other people around you going to work. Some of you actually experienced work. We now take young women to work one day a year and show them what it's like. That ought to scare the devil out of them. <laughs> when I was a kid, I never got away from work. I lived on a farm. Work was there when I got there. We went to work because work was us. You know, you could put a sign up, like, Toys R Us, Work R Us. That's who we were. Work was never a separate part of our life. You didn't go to work, you were at work on a farm. You learned that 
very, very early on. Okay, anticipatory socialization. Ever heard of social learning theory? How do I find out about the world around me? Part of it is by modeling. When I watch television, do I learn something about work by watching people on television and what they do and how they go about doing? What about popular culture like office space? Does that tell me about what work is going to be like? Hopefully, it won't be quite that bad, but unfortunately, it might be. But then, all of a sudden, we get a chance to make the transition. Go to stage two, encounter. Now, our encounter sometimes can be under the heading of role playing. Remember that? Social learning theory? Student teaching. We ought to try to get students in front of a class fairly early on so they don't wait until they're seniors and find out that the one thing in the world they don't want to do is to teach. When I was an an undergraduate, the one thing I knew I would never do, and I have succeeded in that in my life, and that is I have never taught one second of high school. I was not a pleasant person in high school. I was an edgy guy. I didn't like myself. I didn't like much of what went on. I was a pain. I made coaches unhappy. I made band directors unhappy because I wouldn't always go along with the script. It's my nature, I guess, right? Well, I said to myself, God only knows, I didn't have a good time. Why would I want to be around other people that are like me? I didn't want to do that. See, I knew that. I knew that. I never imagined teaching in college, and some of you can say, well, that shows. You're finally catching on after all these years. But encounter means I eventually run into the organization. Send kids out for a Internship. Give them an opportunity to develop the skills and to try it out and to see how it's going to work. Another encounter, job interviews. Job interviews. Here I am. I begin to encounter the organization by the job interview. There's a lot of literature, some of which we summarize in the book, about interviewing. To what extent do I make very, very quick judgments about individuals in a job interview? Social cognition? and then ask questions that confirm my initial hypothesis, social cognition. To what extent do I really listen and let people inform me about who they are as opposed to act toward them in some stereotypic way? Well, there's a lot of literature out there that suggests that we are not particularly good at interviewing. Some of you know that. Some of it is you can't tell people stuff because they've already got their mind made up about you and you can't even lay in front of them stuff that you believe would impress them into hiring you as opposed to somebody else. Encounter. Encounter also goes on to our first days, weeks, months on the job. Was your experience at work similar to what you thought it would be because of preliminary encounter and anticipatory socialization? Have you ever gone to work in an organization where what you had happened to you was a lot different than what you imagined might? And if it's negative, were you happy or were you unhappy? Meaning that if we oversell a job to somebody, when they get there, they're going to be the unhappiest person in the world because the reality is they're not going to be doing what we told them they were going to do. We just told them that they were going to do that. One of the areas that I teach in is public relations. People advertise, I want a public relations person. They show up and it's direct marketing. You're going to find the most desperate person who's not going to be happy for very long because the reality is that they're going to call me. And I'm going to say, how are you? Nice of you to call. Let's visit a while. Been fishing? What you got for dinner? Did you have a good lunch today? What country are you in? When they call me about colleges, I ask them where they're calling from. Philadelphia, that's a long ways from the University of New Mexico, which is in Albuquerque. What are you doing in Philadelphia? Oh, you are a telemarketer. Oh, I see. Sometimes the University of Illinois, they call me and say, I'm in a fraternity or sorority. I say, good, which one? They tell me. Maybe they're making it up. Maybe they're not, but they do it as service. Doesn't it make my little heart flutter to know I'm talking to a real live student as opposed to somebody making money by setting interrupting my dinner. Encounter. What's the world like out there? If you're there long enough, to what extent do you buy in? 
Metamorphosis. Remember your biology? An organism changes from one state to the other. A worm becomes a butterfly. That's metamorphosis. After you've been in an organization for X number of years, are you it? Are you it? Do you then work to force that organization onto other unwilling people that come to work there? Fellow in a company one time, I used to do a study where I would ask them to list their value priorities and the value priorities of the company. Older gentlemen in class took a long time to write down the values of the organization, then immediately copied them and said that they were exactly the same. I asked him about that. He said, this company has fed me for 43 years. I'm six months away from retirement. They put my two children through college, one of whom works here. I am this organization. I am this organization. I think I'm university. I think I'm university. I've been here so long that I am this organization. You know what's also interesting is, in my life, in my life, how many hours have I spent working under direct supervision in an eight to five job? It's amazing. Very, very few. Born on a farm, worked for the Forest Service, worked for colleges, went to university. The concept of coming in at eight and leaving at five is something as foreign to me as anything could be. Maybe that's why I like university. It was that way. I can work 80 hours in a given week. I probably have worked that, come close to that more weeks than not. But the amazing thing is nobody is there supervising me, looking at the clock, making sure that I'm doing any one thing at a given time. Well, metamorphosis. We sometimes also terminate if we find that it's not terribly comfortable. So, in our understanding of the interpersonal components of a of an organization, we're interested in some of the things that we talked about before in chapters uh, in interpersonal communication, discrepancy arousal. If people don't behave the way we think they should, there's an arousal that goes on, communication, accommodation, uh, communicating by leaning toward people. If we want to show that we like them, expecting them to match our communication response, etc., etc. Persuasion, information, control, dependence, codependence, independence, interdependence, terms like these become important. Superior subordinate relationships. One of the interesting superior subordinate relationships, we can talk about it here, we can also talk about it later on, has to do with what's called serial transmission effects. Serial transmission effects means that if I report something to my boss, and my boss reports that to her or his boss, who reports that to his or her boss, to what extent is what I reported the same about five steps away? Classic story in management. Fellow in a warehouse said the warehouse is in terrible shape and if we don't immediately begin to take corrective behavior, the warehouse is going to become so unfunctional it'll be a liability to the company. If I make that report to my boss, what happens? Does my boss want to tell her, his boss, that things are a mess? No, they might say, well, things out in the warehouse are in pretty much of a mess, but we have an aggressive program of investigation and change. And then that boss reports things in the warehouse were pretty much of a mess before, but the corrective actions that are being taken are having positive effect. And finally, the last boss reports that the only unit in this entire organization that is without any problem is the warehouse. Because once upon a time, there were some minor problems out there, but they were all corrected. You see how serial transmission affects things get changed. They get changed from the top down and the top up. If my boss has to report information that he doesn't like to give or she doesn't like to give, blame it on the dean. The dean blames everything on the provost. The provost blames everything on the president and from the bottom up and all of this. So we spend our time blame placing the bad things, taking advantage of the good things. Sounds a whole lot like attribution theory, doesn't it? Well, superior subordinate. Trust 
argumentative. Do you mind working for an argumentative boss? Not if you think the argumentativeness of the boss can work for you. So the boss argues with you, but that's fine if the boss goes and argues with other people and gets for you the goods that you need to do your job well in this department. So we talk about a lot of these kinds of things. Interviewing, information asking, question raising, information seeking, persuading, conflict resolution, uncertainty reduction, many of the themes that we talked about before. Group level of analysis. Organizations are complexes of units. College campus is no different. We have departments. We have sub-departments. We have committees. We have task forces. Teams and meetings. Some of that brings up the notion of group problem solving. One of the questions that we raise is whether groups are better at problem solving than individuals. There's a lot of literature on that. Widely contested. Some people believe that the best way to kill an idea is to turn it over to a group. Well, on chapter, I mean, in, on page 230, uh, 335, we talk about something that's called an assembly effect. A lot of research early on suggests that the pooling of resources that can occur within a group, the pooling of resources can lead to a better decision and to a more satisfying decision. A better decision because we get a chance to critique, evaluate, analyze, share information, ask questions, pool our knowledge, pool our expertise, and come up with a better decision than we would have made otherwise. Secondly, a more satisfying decision because if we get to help make a decision, are we more likely to want to implement it? If we get to help make a decision, are we more likely to want to implement it? Well, okay, that sort of then brings us down to a competition between two ways of looking at groups. One is called groupthink. Groupthink actually was a body of research that came out shortly after the Bay of Pigs fiasco under John Kennedy's administration. And I indicate at the bottom of page 335 and the top of 336 the factors that lead us into groupthink. We could argue that the current administration is suffering from groupthink. We could argue that all administrations at the top level of our country suffers from some degree of groupthink. Groups limit rather than increase the number of alternatives they consider. Do the Republicans in the office want to eliminate all of the things that the Democrats might want to talk about? See? Groupthink, etc., etc. If we settle on an idea which we think is the idea that the boss likes, or if the boss says, I like that idea, does that idea have a greater likelihood of surviving? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So groupthink. Well, a young graduate student wanting to prove groupthink set out to do that, became very, very famous, actually ended up with a pretty good academic career, but as far as I know, never wrote anything on groupthink other than a master's thesis. What he did was to try to demonstrate that groupthink was going to occur because if you give groups an opportunity to make a decision, his argument was they will discover the common ground, the common theme that they prefer, and once they do, that's what the decision outcome would be. So he created a set of scenarios where he allowed individuals to indicate before they discussed what degree of riskiness they would prefer. One of the items had to do with an engineer that had a job that was very stable 
and it was not going to give him a great deal or her a great deal of increased monetary income raises over the next number of years. At a conference, this individual had talked to somebody in a startup company which had great prospect of financial reward, but in two years it could be defunct. To what extent do you think this individual should take a risky decision? So if you put five people together, the argument in this line of analysis was what they will do is discover the common denominator and that's what they will prefer. One way to do that is to let each five, each of the five members mark a evaluation form. It's a wonderful design. You get that number you get the number that they preferred as a group afterward, you compare those, you do a statistical analysis and see whether there is a significant difference between the number that they preferred collectively as opposed to the number that they preferred individually translated into a mean. Meaning, when I'm in the group, am I willing to come up with a decision more risky than I would without having discussed. What he found was what we used to call the risky shift phenomena, and that is that the decision by the vast majority of the groups on all of these items tended toward an increased willingness to risk after discussion. Except for two items which always turned out to be more conservative after discussion. So then it was changed the theory from risky shift theory to choice shift theory. Now, what I have on 336 is an explanation for why people will change their mind in a group contrary to what they would have preferred before they got into the group and listened to the discussion. One of these is that we are influenced by others, particularly leaders within the group. And the leader of the group may not be the person who is specified as the leader of the group. It may not be the boss, but it may be an influential member of the team. So the leaders of the group can influence others to be more risky. One of the characteristics of leadership is a willingness to be more risky, perhaps. Social comparison in the face of risk-taking. Do we like to be known as risky or as conservative? The argument is that in American society, we like to be seen as risk takers. Is that right? We don't like to be seen as conservative. If we think that everybody is preferring three out of a scale of one to five, five being more risk, we start talking about the virtue of four. Diffusion of responsibility. Ever talk to a group of 12-year-olds standing around something that got broke? Wasn't I. Or they'll probably say it wasn't me. Little children, how did that vase get broke? No, no, wasn't I. Diffusion of responsibility. In an organization, if something goes wrong, bosses all say, I don't know, wasn't I, my idea. Wasn't me, somebody else. Diffusion of responsibility. There used to be a comedian who said, the devil made me do it. That let him off the hook. Anything that he wanted to do, and if he got caught, it was because the devil made him do it. Diffusion of responsibility. I can always blame my friends. How many times our daughter, as a teenager, said, well, it was other people's idea. I didn't really want to do it. We never believed that. We figured that she was a leader Individuation. Individuation means that in battle, everybody else is going to die but not me. Individuation means that I can make a riskier decision because it will not affect me. Subjective expected utilities. The assumption is that through discussion I can come closer to a rewarding and avoid, a, and avoid a less rewarding decision. Well, the argument in all of these items, one through four, is that a group, because of the dynamics of taking in information, processing it, and outputting that information, that should be a model that we recall, right? 
can indeed move from a more conservative to a riskier decision or can move from a more conserv I mean more risky to a more conservative decision meaning that discussion can count it adds value to what goes on between when people come together and the final decision that they make all right we've got two other units within the organizations oh let me go on down uh, internal level of analysis infrastructure culture uncertainty reduction themes that we've talked about before I seek information to reduce uncertainty I want to know what's going on culture tells me how we do what we do in the organization infrastructure that's another place that we can talk about serial transmission effects and for a definition of serial transmission effects you can look on page 339 the organization now communicating externally there is a macro system within our society there is mass mediated communication I can buy advertising time and space I can get my public relations experts I can go out I can influence news gathering I can create stories I can communicate many of you as you think about a career in communication are on one side of that equation or the other and we're going to talk more about mass communication starting on Thursday anyway but this is a good place for us to sort of see that nexus large complex organizations want to use mass media to communicate about themselves paid advertising public relations are two very obvious examples but the same token people outside want to know what's going on investigators want to know what's going on activists regulators legislators may want to tell the organization to behave differently and so we can have a contest of interests contest of values contest of facts between the organization so I mentioned here public relations and advertising and then we get into an interesting little theory the difference between having a symmetrical relationship with people outside as opposed to having an asymmetrical relationship a symmetrical relationship works on the assumption that the organization may find that it's wrong it listens to its critics and it changes its behavior an asymmetrical organization works on the assumption that it is always right and even communicates aggressively perhaps and uses other means to convince and or to manipulate and or to dominate opponents so that the opponents have to accept and or agree with the organization so we come to a notion of how would you want to practice public relations symmetrically or asymmetrically how do you want to do marketing communication in a symmetrical or an asymmetrical way it's an important kind of decision because ultimately it suggests how the organization fits into culture how the culture shapes the organization moreover we know that large organizations have in the past and will in the future shape the larger culture of which all of us are a part advertising is a part of that to what extent has all of the advertising money over the last number of years for instance created a sense of what is good about society what is or who are good people is it true that the more I can consume the better I am is consumption a social virtue well we talk about those kinds of things in various contexts now this also lays the foundation for where we're going next mass mediated communication we're going to talk about the media we're going to remember that most of what brings us the media are themselves large organizations newspapers television stations chains news gathering operations Hollywood in a sense these are organizations that make their living off of mass media and one question we're going to ask is do they add a positive value to our society 
do they add a positive value to our society? So we'll end on that note. Pick it up again on Thursday. And don't forget that I promised that we would give the exams back. Thank you.